This video is brought to you in part by Aura. More on them in a bit. God of War is a tough game to properly revisit because it's a game defined more by cultural response and legacy than by the content of the game itself. When you think of Kratos up until the most recent saga, your first thought would usually be something like angry jacked dude. When you think about its gameplay, the word brutal generally pops up first. Or if you're a bit more looped into gaming history, you might get annoyed at this being one of the key titles that led to the following decade to be overstuffed with quick time events. And in this first God of War's case, when you think of Kratos' motivations for his vendetta against the Pantheon, odds are decent that even if you've never played it, you already know the big spoilery reveal, and you'll be surprised to hear that it's not something immediately told to the player. Kratos and the God of War brand so immediately became an icon for PlayStation that they just as quickly became a caricature to the wider gaming space. You don't really hear about how even back from the very start of production, this first game was one of the earliest titles at PlayStation to truly and fully adopt a story-first game design approach. These games had been movies from the start. It's why they never aimed for gameplay as flashy as A Devil May Cry or Ninja Gaiden, and why they crossed back and forth between hack and slash gameplay and a more traditional adventure game style, never quite nailing either side, but maintaining enough of a wow factor that its aura made up for it. A lot of this is why I personally never quite took to God of War. I never really connected with the gameplay enough and the bits that I would try out to want to stick with it and put up with what was being portrayed universally, often even in official previews and ads, as this one-dimensional character. If I wanted violent gameplay, by the time I was old enough to have disposable income, well, I already had Gears of War, or Mortal Kombat, or better hack and slash games, all on prettier consoles with less baggage than a half-dozen game franchise that had passed me by. Also, I had a grudge, but that was against Ascension, and that's a story for another day. See, the eventual one-note stigma that followed God of War is part of what led the developers at Santa Monica Studio to come to a reckoning after that final PS3 game. It's what led to a reinvention of the series, and the most interesting part for a nerd like me, a reinvention of Kratos himself. It's part of what finally piqued my interest and got me to dive in. It's eventually what got me invested, and it's what brings me back here today. In an era where nearly as many people have played that first PS4 game as have played the entire Greek saga, I think it's time to revisit the God of War series from the jump, to look at the franchise and its production both in their original contexts and with the benefit of hindsight, to see how the tale of the developer adapted and evolved, and how that informed the series following suit. And in this first game's case, I think it's time for me as a previous non-fan of this original saga to shout from the top of Mount Olympus that, although it's certainly a bit dated nowadays, this game is still f***ing rad. This is God of War. Dark is an important word for God of War. Not just to describe its contents, because, uh, duh, but also due to its earliest history. Director David Jaffe had been given a second chance in 2001. One of the key figures behind the Twisted Metal franchise, Jaffe went from testing Sony-published Nintendo games in the early 90s to supervising on some of the most important titles for the PlayStation's American launch in 95. At times, he acted as a producer and others a director, but more often than not, from afar, acting as one of Sony's remote oversights for this external studio in Utah, a team of engineers who had never before worked on video games. Now that's a whole messy story in its own right. I've got a video covering the Twisted Metal series and the related founding of Sony's Santa Monica Studio if you want to learn more. The short of it is that Sony was very much learning as it went during the PS1 days, coming in with no real outline of what to do and using its handful of already employed game testers to lead the American front as game directors now. After the breakout successes of Twisted Metal 1 and 2, Jaffe was given a blank check by Sony to develop his own game in LA with his own team, which he tentatively called Dark Guns. He's described this game as having been developed out of fear, trying to figure out how to keep the audience built up from Twisted Metal to translate to another game franchise entirely. After four years of messy production and shifting from a third-person shooter to a flying shooter that would give players control of a UFO abducting humans, Sony canceled the game. Having felt like he'd blown a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Jaffe flipped back into helping on what would become Twisted Metal Black, working once again remotely with the guys in Utah, who had just split off from their prior company to found a new, near-identical one for the first of, I swear to God, like four times over the course of that franchise's history. It just, those guys kept doing that. Now really quick, I do want to talk about the sponsor of today's video, 
Aura. A while back, somebody tried to dox me because they were upset at my Sonic Team documentary or something. Uh, I'm not sure, but they tagged convicted felon and former Sonic figurehead Yuji Naka, so I think they were upset about... Sonic? Thing is, all they got was my elementary school address, because I take care of my personal data. And Aura has genuinely been a massive help with making it even easier to keep that sort of sensitive info safe. For example, back when we started my podcast, Crub, I had to help some of the others find the opt-out request pages for the countless scummy data brokers out there, the ones that keep making money off of your private info and then hide the opt-out behind a page that doesn't load. Aura takes that pain and makes it painless. They watch for signs of identity theft, they can monitor your accounts for unauthorized purchases, Aura's just a one-stop safety shop. So let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. Sign up at Aura.com slash Bolt and start your 14-day free trial today. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this video, and now, let's get back to it. When this most brooding of car combat games released in mid-2001, a higher-up came to Jaffe with a request. Sony Santa Monica's first game, the futuristic racer Kinetica, needed some help getting over the finish line in time for launch. Opened in 1999 and thrown right into the fire developing for theoretical PS2 hardware specs, this new studio had struggled with making the promising game much more than a cool tech demo, since much of the effort had gone into team building and creating a game engine that could easily be built upon for whatever would come next, knowing from the start that Kinetica was going to be a one-off. Seeing as Jaffe was pretty versed in vehicle games by now, it was offered that if he would hop over to lend a hand, he would get another shot at developing whatever game he wanted afterwards, another blank check with Santa Monica as his team. So after that game made its launch later that year, and under budget at that, Jaffe pitched Dark Odyssey, described as, what if we took the hack and slash adventure game Onimusha and did it with Greek mythology instead? Originally, Jaffe had tossed around the idea of making this a first-person adventure, but since the team's reference material was mostly full of third-person games like Ico and Devil May Cry, that, of course, didn't last long. Oddly, not the first time somebody tried to make a mainline God of War as a first-person experience. That would happen again. Fun little aside, given Onimusha and DMC's influence on this game, the first few God of Wars were published by Capcom in Japan. Production began in 2002, with an ambitious aim of approaching this new title more as a story and less as a game. That ambition led to one of the constant truths of game development rearing its ugly head as Kinetica's codebase was less built upon and more completely overhauled for a totally different kind of game. Although, if you look online, you'll see more unsourced and outright false claims that Kinetica's non-existent engine was used in pretty much every early PS2 game it wasn't, then you'll find any actual discussion of the game itself, which is a bit of a shame, because that game's kinda sick. Anyway, the game that would become God of War was going to cut out all the needless filler scenes and backtracking, and really anything that would take up unnecessary playtime. It would take inspiration from films like Raiders of the Lost Ark and push to be a more proper adventure game with outside-the-box believable puzzle design. Real meaty puzzles, not just your baby Zelda block pushing. That's the, that, that's the wrong clip. Where's the Zelda clip? Nope, that's still got what Whatever. In fact, in classic Jaffe fashion, he wanted the intro to have a little Navi-esque guide fairy to spit tutorials at you before Kratos would violently rip it apart halfway through the opening level. In nearly every contemporary interview or article about the game, he bent over backwards to say that this game wasn't at all inspired by Zelda, not one bit. Now, the designers, however, the folks that were more in the trenches, they cited Zelda a bunch, to the point that the second game's director and the series' main writer after this first game, Cory Barlog, said that in 2's early script, I think I had the, the, the Wind Waker ambitions, like, so Kratos was taking a boat to like all these different islands and stuff, it was just yeah. insane. This is where the stories begin to perhaps split a bit, although they do reconverge here and there. When I dug through Twisted Metal, I had found a trend that Jaffe's projects often contained this disconnect between between what he said his vision was and what the rest of the team said the execution was. In that series' case, it was understandable because he was working remotely in the mid-90s, not an easy task, and there was an on-site co-director who was naturally able to be more hands-on. Although Jaffe's pitch or core idea would be the basis around which these projects began, they didn't always stay there, and in some cases my takeaway was that he was an ideas guy or a vibes guy. Perhaps that his title would better fit what we call a creative director in games today, or even dare I say a producer in some cases. This all goes back to what I mentioned about Sony starting off with PlayStation as this decentralized fly-by-night group, where SNES playtesters would suddenly be in charge of making games for a brand new system. 
The company didn't want anything to do with games until one of their engineers made a backdoor deal with Nintendo, because Sony itself was also a decentralized mess of a company. They only continued developing the PlayStation purely out of spite when Nintendo killed their partnership, and for about the first 20 years of PlayStation existing as a brand, each region and indeed each studio was often operating with autonomy, meaning that the role of director meant different things in different buildings, even if we as the consumer always took it as Hideo Kojima. Kojima styled God King responsible for every minor detail we do or don't like. Now, going back to Jaffe, I don't say this to take away from his contributions to this game, of course, but to remind that once an idea leaves your lips, if you're working with other people, their interpretations and interpolations become just as key to the end product, sometimes more so. Where Jaffe cites his inspirations plainly, stuff like Indiana Jones or Clash of the Titans, or let's take Greek myth and add sex to it, which is just an incredible thing to read if you know anything about Greek myth, the artists and animators tasked with taking his descriptions of Kratos and turning it from a vague statement to a defined character, well, their inspirations naturally come from elsewhere. That middle ground is where the magic usually tends to happen, but since those two sides are never going to align all the time, me and the team butted heads a lot. And this sort of, as Jaffe has described it, hostile environment led to the game's production dramatically affecting his personal life, which is why he stepped back into a figurehead role after God of War 1 released. Now, I've never found a satisfactory answer as to exactly how much input he had in God of War 2 after that initial script pitch beyond occasionally being around to bounce ideas with his successor, but since he was actively working at his newly opened studio and remotely helping that Twisted Metal team in Utah again, directing multiple other games during that span, or being listed as a director multiple times during that span, it's my belief that his creative director title in God of War 2 was similarly maybe closer to ceremonial. Especially since during a promotional interview for God of War 2, Jaffe told Jeff Keighley that he felt, after working on God of War 1, that games would never in our lifetime have the same emotional resonance as films, and that's why he went back to making arcade styled games. He said that as the creative director promoting God of War 2. Taking the creative reins for much of the rest of the series was Corey Barlog, who came in as lead animator in 2003, a year into this first game's production. Barlog described the job as coming in expecting a vacation after the X-Men fighting game he had worked on prior, but he quickly discovered that a cakewalk this would not be. See, there was no combo system when he joined on. Not because it was super early in production or anything, this was a design choice because the early design goal of God of War was to be 10% deeper than medieval. Pressing Square just unleashed a random attack to show you how uncontrollable Kratos' rage was. Barlog, by all accounts, he synergized with the more collaborative and perhaps less combative aspects of production, and the team ended up fueled by the best motivator, once again, spite, after a contemporary interview where a Japanese game director commented that Western teams couldn't make good action games. It's kind of fitting when you think about it, then, that this series took on a trajectory similar to countless Japanese action-adventure games, where the original creator's vision was passed along to other creatives who later became even more associated with the franchise in the eyes of fans. I think we're maybe just a bit more vocal about it when our successor's vision shifts from ours over time. Kill Zeus in the first couple of minutes of God of War 3, you'd have like Egyptian Kratos and Norse Kratos, and he kills Thor and takes the hammer, and Kratos realizes that you kill gods f with finality, is that you get people to stop believing in them. And now with all of the gods dead, he uses the Blades of Chaos, we were going to use the six axis, and you were slitting your wrist, and he basically, that's how he dies. Kratos becomes the Grim Reaper. And sort of that was sort of the ultimate way, correct, that we had planned on ending the whole God of War. That's the way you planned on ending Well, it. we, come on. Oh, and if you're wondering how that original Dark Odyssey name became God of War, they put those two names in a hat with a third at the hands of the gods, and God of War, thankfully, was the one they pulled out. Now, the last major aspect of production to dig into is Kratos himself, but we'll do that throughout this game and certainly beyond. Both in pre-release previews and after its 2005 launch, God of War received critical acclaim, with at least one outlet citing it as the first true next-gen experience. They weren't referring to the impending Xbox 360 with that, it's just more common than you may remember for people to say that a console generation hasn't really started for four plus years. Now, one of my favorite things about God of War, coming back to it with fresh eyes and many, many years later, is its pretty earnest attempt at replicating the style of classic Greek myths, even as they take liberties here and there. 
I mean, first the title screen kind of punches you in the face with a wall of fire to symbolize not necessarily how deep Kratos' rage is, but instead how much your eyes are currently burning looking at it. But once we're in the game proper, we get hit with one of the most Homeric writing devices of them all. An in Midias race opening narrated by an omniscient third-person muse slash future character to be revealed, depicting Kratos at his absolute lowest moment. The gods of Olympus have abandoned. Now there is no hope. And Kratos cast himself from the highest mountain in all of Greece. After ten years of suffering, ten years of endless nightmares, it would finally come to an end. Death would be his escape from madness. It's iconic to those who remember it, but it's also one of the more immediately forgotten parts of Kratos' character, that his first display of emotion wasn't rage, it's a numbed despair, resignation, and it sets up intrigue that we also tend to forget when it comes to this character. What did that decade of suffering look like to him? Over the course of the prequels, we would of course find out, not to mention the stuff this first game reveals later on, but again, it's just a little thing that's hard not to take for granted if you're not specifically in the year 2005 before the series' reputation began to precede it. It's also worth noting that every single game in this franchise does this same seamless transition from Kratos' zoom shot face cam on the title screen into the story intro. Well, except the Java phone game, which, yes, is canon, but they had about 60 kilobytes to work with, so we can probably give them a pass there. Mind you, this is all not even a minute into this game. Once we flash back to the tutorial, we get a mostly stellar introduction into the other side of Kratos that we all do expect today, the big brooding slashy boy. This first level shows Kratos fighting his way across a series of ships to take down the Hydra at the command of Ares. Like is often the case with the God of War games, this opener was the final thing the team designed to ensure that it would be a fitting encapsulation and preview of the game to come, as well as to ensure the team knew every trick and mechanic that would make it through production so that they didn't waste time stumbling through the most important part of an action game. Remember, this was still the blockbuster era. If you wanted those rentals to maybe turn into buys, you had to keep them hooked. Now, I'll save some of the more detailed mechanical discussion for later, but I will preface by saying that, for me personally, unless I really fall in love with a hack-and-slash or beat-em-up game's mechanics, I tend to default to whatever dominant strategy I put together early on while still experimenting with new moves as I get them, of course. God of War 1 is pretty basic for the genre. You play as a dude being given magical powers from the gods themselves, which means you're usually playing a power fantasy rather than any sort of proper struggle, and there really aren't many enemies that require a unique tactic to weaken or defeat, so you're gonna see a lot of repeating combos throughout this footage. It's notably forgiving, also. The parry window is exceptionally generous, so much so that unless I'm forgetting a prompt somewhere, it's either never taught to you with a pop-up like other facets of the game are, or it's shown to you so far in that you naturally would have discovered it on your own well before that. Since parrying is tied to L1, the block button, if you fail when trying to time your parry, odds are you'll still have gotten the block off anyway since it comes up super fast, and because the parry timing is so wide, you're almost certainly going to see that satisfying slow-mo zoom shot within a few minutes of starting. Blocking is even a move canceler for at least the more basic combos, meaning that you can safely go nuts most of the time and just tap L1 to cover an incoming attack if you see one, or to cancel a combo and then immediately roll to safety if that attack's unblockable. Between all of this and the opening level giving you the first and best of God of War 1's four magic abilities, the Poseidon's Rage AoE attack which just shreds everything, the game's kind of just telling DMC or Ninja Gaiden fans, hey, we're not that kind of game. The only other combat note I have that came up immediately is more a general nitpick for a lot of the genre from around this time. I know I'm not alone on this sort of thing being just kind of a bummer. The combo hit meter resets super quickly, and sometimes it feels like without any rhyme or reason you've got slightly more or less time to keep racking up hits. Now, combos here only matter for a couple trophies on the PS3 version, and for marginally increasing the experience multiplier you get for each additional hit, but it's of course the kind of thing that's in the game to make you feel awesome, so any perceived randomness or, oh, that sucks, that was a frame too late to get that hit in, it's just the mildest of bummers. Moving past that, this tutorial level introduces some other basic gameplay notes that I should hit on here, like frequent quicktime events to defeat larger foes. These are often technically optional, and depending on the enemy, it might reward you with either some health or magic refills on top of some satisfying and gruesome animations as Kratos eviscerates the beast in question. 
God of War 1 has three different kinds of QTEs that you're certainly familiar with. There are your button mash prompts, your spin the stick prompts, which nowadays will probably make you think about controller drift, and there are reaction time QTEs, each of which will go from feeling like a fun little throwback to very, very quickly overstaying its welcome. Like, we all remember God of War as one of THE QTE games. Obviously, they've existed since the days of Dragon's Lair, even 15 years before Shenmue coined the term QTE to begin with, but God of War, alongside Resident Evil 4 two months before it, are commonly pointed to as THE games that defined the gimmick going into a console generation that very quickly beat said gimmick into the ground with ham-fisted attempts to be cinematic. But where RE4 really only has a couple dozen of these in total, with most of those being a cinematic dodge during some battles, or a press square to run from a giant boulder, in God of War 1, you're lucky to go 10 to 15 minutes without mashing a button for artistic effect when opening every single door, for example. Don't get me wrong, I didn't actively get fed up with it or anything, not until near the very end of the game for other reasons than the QTEs themselves, but on one hand, it's funny seeing the humble beginnings of one of the series' most defining features since the pop-ups, they don't stand out visually on screen at all, there's no prompt in circumstance, if you will, and on the other hand, well, that hand actually started to cramp a teensy bit when I'm told to mash the circle button to stab through the face of several minotaurs back to back to back, something that happens frequently and as early as the beginning of level 2. To anybody who might adamantly want these things back, I say you should probably play the game again on hands 10 to 20 years older than the last time you played these games, because a little bit of moderation would be fine, but in this game in particular, it is excessive at points. Anyway, on top of QTEs, this intro also, uh, intros you to tightrope walking sections very quickly. More on those later, probably. I, I don't really have much to say about them. It's just really funny smashing a Hydra head around and then seeing this badass shakily tiptoe across some wooden planks. It also introduces the two upgrade collectibles for health and magic respectively, hidden in chests throughout the game. And last, but certainly not least, it introduces a, a crate that you can kick around. Yeah, for as much as God of War 1 was supposed to harken back to classic adventure games with unique and novel puzzle design, games like Another World or contemporaries like Ico, and implement these higher level puzzles that didn't just feel like video gamey things, but rather felt like organic extensions of your surroundings, well, most puzzles are kinda just video gamey things, like pushing a block around. Or kicking it, which was this game's way of showing you that it's not like other block puzzles, because you can kick them, and that, and that makes it different than, than pushing them, even though you're just pushing them. Alright, look, I know there's a lot of critique happening here for an opening that I praised as mostly stellar. These things are what, when looking back on the intro having finished the game, make this mostly, and I would rather talk about the shallow parts now, because then, unlike the game, I'm leaving the shallow parts at the door instead of leaning on them for the rest of this damn journey. And in fairness, it's these things that also help make it a mostly stellar tutorial, because it covers all the bases and doesn't shy away from the issues that do, at times, plague the game. If you get through this opening 20 minutes, you have a pretty spot-on idea of what the next 8-ish hours are gonna look like. A lot of the really great parts of this level are the little details, or simply are related to the aura this game sets up, from the foggy, rainy backdrop to the micro-boss fights against the Hydra heads that pop up throughout the level, to seeing Kratos just not give a single damn about the humans running in terror all around him. Help, you can kill him for some free health if you need it. It's the kind of tonal table dressing that you can't really point at too much without saying, hey, look at this cool thing, and now this one, and now this one. You can tell from the one or two humans that talk to Kratos, and his total glazed-eye lack of response, that 10 years of serving the gods has completely washed him of any empathy for the plight of any normal soldier. That's good stuff being thrown at you. It's also just pure metal at times, like walking down the throat of the defeated Hydra and grabbing the key to the captain's chamber in order to save the innocent women and children trapped inside, grabbing that key from around the neck of the captain and, and letting him die just because. It, it's a badass, stupid little moment that also highlights that Kratos does kind of have a heart still for the truly innocent, even if he hides it. The camera throughout the game, to give another example, is this pretty masterful combination of forced perspective in most rooms, think the Resident Evil style of camera, but with seamless transitions to tracking shots as you navigate through corridors, or wide pans back to show the scale of the area you're entering, or when you enter Pandora's temple later in the game to find her box, which sounds kind of gross when I phrase it that way, but I'm gonna keep it in, there's a Dutch angle. It shifts to a Dutch angle to show you that things are about to maybe go wrong. It's, it's great, I love it. The cuts from room to room mostly make sense as well and were fairly well tuned to gameplay, avoiding the pitfall where you're suddenly just running to the left because you entered a room with a perspective that's 90 degrees offset from the way you were just moving. 
Since the areas themselves are so well sculpted, it's pretty rare that you'll miss a doorway, an object or a point of interest, or even a path to a secret area. And the game's even surprisingly forgiving with those secrets too, which I didn't expect at all for a game from this era. Whether it's the health or magic upgrades, or later some keys to a secret room, the game has more of each collectible than you need to max out, so it's fairly hard to make it to the credits without having done so. And I will give a modicum of credit to that crate pushing section for, if nothing else, trying to show you that you'll sometimes need non-traditional solutions to puzzles. In this case, unless you're me and somehow make it first try by just pushing it to see if you can and it actually works for some reason, the idea is that if you don't kick the block and time it right, the archers will break it with their arrows and force you to go back and get a new one since you need the crate to reach the next section. It's not a fun puzzle, honestly I would call it fairly badly designed since it's five minutes into the game and it only serves to kill the pace, but since broadly the puzzles are one of the more common criticisms of this first game, yeah, I guess that's a fitting tutorial. It certainly could have been worse. Jaffe's on record as having pushed to make the intro have some larger branching pathways, which definitely wouldn't have helped things. Anyway, we've been on this intro for a bit too long. For a game that's definitely not at all inspired by Zelda, the boss fight against the Hydra is pretty damn Zelda, down to the low angle shot of this behemoth roaring at you and the action puzzle method of taking it down. Both of the smaller heads on the side have the same attacks that you've already seen throughout the level, again, fairly good tutorial at times, and once you've whittled each one's health down, it's time to rush up the blocks and jump onto this little spiked platform to stab through its head and incapacitate it. Only once you've taken down both mini-heads can you climb your way up to fight the big boy. Now, the fight might go on for just a smidge too long thanks to a combination of tiny platform, a roar attack that pushes you off said tiny platform, and this guy only having two similar attacks for you to dodge or counter while whittling his health down bit by bit with your basic combo. For a moment, it might feel like you're throwing your head at a wall because the first two QTEs are the same, with Kratos smacking the Hydra's head into the ship's mast, and then that mast breaks off and sharpens, and you realize, oh no, essentially Kratos is doing a crafty 4D chess move to impale it once the final QTE moment comes. Or maybe it wasn't a chess move and it just was a cool coincidence that he happened to do that while beating it to death out of anger. Could be either. Honestly, I'm cool with either. What's perhaps my biggest critique of God of War 1 comes from this moment, however, because the boss fight sets up an expectation of scale that the game doesn't quite pay off. See, the next boss fight, at least what I would consider one, is six hours later near the end of the game. God of War 1 really only has three proper boss fights in total. There are enemies like a multiplying Cerberus that act as mini-bosses, but pretty much every mini-boss is immediately followed by an identical second one right from that very moment, or within a few screens, at which point they become another normal enemy that you just get used to seeing all the time. It's not just the bosses that are sprinkled in oddly either, the story's somewhat put on hold after this intro before suddenly coming back into focus hours later. And in that same vein, kind of unintentionally fitting for a Greek epic-inspired narrative, there's not really a defined act structure to this meandering odyssey. This first game's pacing just isn't all that great once you step back and look at it. In part, that's a consequence of one of this franchise's trademarks, which I touched on earlier. From the title screen through to the credit roll, these games try their absolute hardest to never break away and jump you from one location to another without directly showing you Kratos getting from point A to B. That's even the case in between games, with God of War 2 and 3 opening in the exact framing of where the prior game had finished. The only real jump in this case is only technically one right after this ship level, as we jump from Kratos opening the captain's quarters and seeing that he's too late, that the undead soldiers have slaughtered all the innocents locked inside, evoking his nightmares of all the slaughter that he himself has wrought over the years. We jump from that to a narration explaining that Kratos over and over again sailed the oceans at the behest of the gods, killing countless monsters like this Hydra haunted by his nightmares that no violence, no booze, no three-way QTE minigames can cover up, Kratos demands to the goddess Athena that the gods step in and fix those nightmares. We request one final task of you, Kratos. Your greatest challenge awaits in Athens, where even now my brother Ares lays siege as we speak. Athens is on the verge of destruction. It is the will of Ares, my great city fall. Zeus has forbidden the gods from waging war on each other. That is why it must be you, Kratos. Only a mortal trained by a god has a chance at defeating Ares. Which one of you got inspired by this game and tried to use quarter circle inputs in bed for real, by the way? I, I know one of you weirdos had to have done it, so just come clean. When will you relieve me of these nightmares? 
After this scene, though, the game never really jumps ahead in time without you actively controlling Kratos going from point A to B, at least not without showing you the full breadth of his journey. There is, to be fair, one cutscene a bit later that replaces a gameplay section that got cut to get from point A to B, but they show that in a montage. Anyway, going back to Kratos' boat, wait, hold on, bro, you live like this? Kratos lands in Athens, and then we spend a brisk two-ish hours going through the city in order to find and then rescue Athena's oracle, often making heavy use of backtracking. You know, the thing that God of War, being a cinematic story-first adventure, was explicitly claimed to focus on avoiding. No, honestly, a couple times this backtracking is really well-earned and serves a good purpose, highlighting the destruction of Ares' forces while you've been exploring the other side of town or whatever. Other times, though, it is very clearly padding, like when you have to climb through a building chasing a woman for her key, only for her to fall to her death right at the start of the area that you just started in, so you have to jump down, grab the key, and then go all the way through that same building again to use said key, this time with some new enemy types in the way. But after a couple hours on this oracle goose chase, we make our way to the desert to find the temple hiding Pandora's box, the only thing that could empower a mortal like Kratos to defeat Ares. Pandora's Temple is a five-hour-long mega-dungeon, taking you through a couple different wings, but always circling back to a giant, well, actually circular room that itself is a puzzle. You gotta rotate the whole room by slowly pushing a crank to first access whichever wing of the temple is next, but ultimately to open the path to Pandora's box. Honestly, it's a really cool concept at its macro scale. You can feel that Indiana Jones or perhaps some Tomb raider -y inspiration coming through at times with puzzles that are meant to feel practical, like core facets of the temple's physical design, and with the game really liking to make you rip off people's skulls. It all makes sense narratively as well, since the tomb's architect had spent centuries layering protection over protection, all to please the gods, a man who loses his wife and kids one by one while fulfilling the gods' will. Does Kratos recognize the resemblance there? Hard to say, but he does recognize that the architect's family skulls happen to be key-shaped, somehow. One of the game's better uses of Quick Time Event also. It's both rad as a video gamey mid-2000s edge moment, and a little bit unsettling when you think deeper about it, having to physically defile caskets like this and see Kratos just not give a damn. I'll throw another Zelda comparison out and say that having a player-shiftable dungeon that itself is part of the macro puzzle feels like a great, in some ways, better predecessor to Skyward Sword's final dungeon, or to the Divine Beasts. And it's not like I ever felt confused as to where to go to progress when I was in the temple. It's fairly straightforward and relatively well-guided. The issue is more that each wing takes 60 to 90 minutes. The moment-to-moment -moment puzzles are often more repetitive block kicking or some incredibly tight timing windows on activating a bunch of switches, and really just that this thing keeps going on forever without enough visual or mental stimulation to avoid everything kind of blending together. Every time you think you've seen the last of this spiky, smashy block hallway, boom, another combat encounter here because the game's got to remind you that it's a hack and slash game, as if you didn't just fight a bunch of enemies in the last wing you were in, over and over and over again, without really much variety. By the time you're done with this temple, you just get heaved into a section of the game that by the developer's own admission was absolutely rushed and probably could have used a lot more time and balancing, and then suddenly Kratos opens Pandora's box, whose power is making him giant clank, and you're in a final boss fight with Ares that quickly swaps your entire moveset and plays nothing like the rest of the game. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, and not just because Athens before it is also full of sections that last a few loops too long thanks to a lot of ad nauseum repetition. Because the focus of these games is to create a seamless experience in these areas that could feel like real, living places, God of War constantly tries to avoid the traditional concept of levels. Athens, for example, is made up of the gate to the city, the road to the city, the, uh, the, 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 the city, but mostly its rooftops, the temple of the oracle, and the sewers, which actually take you right back to the front gate of the city. That's because at the gate, the path actually forks immediately, as you'll find once you have first gotten there. To the right is the path through the desert to Pandora's box, which is inaccessible at first. The correct way to go, then, following in the footsteps of the director's favorite game, Metroid, is to the left. Although God of War is linear, the world design makes use of a few of these pseudo-non-linear moments, trusting the player to survey their surroundings and use context clues to figure out how to progress. For example, if you see a ladder next to a normal wall, you should know that that means that that entire wall is scalable, even if it doesn't look like it, simply because the ladder is there to let you start climbing it, I guess. Sometimes the climbable and non-climbable wall textures look pretty similar or the same, too, so you just gotta hope there's a, a ladder there. It does sometimes run into the, okay, which path is the progression one so I can go do the other one first issue, such as when it comes time to obtain Zeus's Fury, a lightning bolt projectile given to you by, well, Zeus. 
Eventually, while doing the intended path, either during this little side path with archers that you can't reach that'll shoot you and send you to your death, or when you find a soldier refusing to open the gate to progress for you, because doing so would open the door behind him to the beasts that'll eat him alive, you'll realize that you need to backtrack to find whatever upgrade you're missing. Again, kind of like a Metroid game. Fittingly, God of War is maybe the best PS2 era example that I can think of, of masking destructible walls so that they don't stick out so blatantly as if there's a big break me sign in front of it. Weird how that happened, huh? Now, I don't have too much to add about Athens just yet, beyond saying that there are some stunning rooms and moments as Kratos fights his way through the city. The amount of time and energy that's gone into animating an entire city-wide war in the background when Kratos is climbing up the sides of buildings, it's the reason people had to call it the first real next-gen experience for a generation that was already five years old. Shadow of the Colossus is one of its few contemporaries that captures a similar scale, and that wouldn't be out for another seven months. There are rooms in the Athens main courtyard area with reflective floors, which I'm just a sucker for on PS2 games, areas in the sewer with puddles that do the same, or long ladder climbs with a tracking camera shot that show in the foreground the dichotomy between some god rays peering in the windows and a soldier's final resting place nestled into some wooden framing on the way up while Kratos is climbing in the background. There are so many of these sorts of little, almost contemplative moments that just do not get enough credit for standing out so strongly amongst all of the endless action and violence that the game's known for. I think they stick out so well because it's right around this point in the game, having fought through most of Athens and again foolishly feeling like, oh wow, this game must be brisk if I'm already like 40% of the way through it, it's right around here that the game starts to just run into a wall. However, it's a wall that I realized afterwards, after finishing the game, that I'd been subconsciously preparing for by tuning out so much combat. Obviously, that's what you're here for, I know, but what I mean by this is that God of War seems to assign a set number of enemies to each combat encounter in order to tune it just right for the team's intended experience, which, duh, that's what you'd expect, but it does this per individual spawn point rather than filling out a quota from each class of enemies in that fight. So let's say you're fighting a run-of-the-mill horde of enemies, which often feels like they're throwing 20 to 30 at you in total, with let's say no more than 8 enemies on screen at once. If you wipe out one enemy, another spawns in its place, usually an identical type of enemy as well. So you've wiped out all the basic grunts until they stop respawning, right? And you've got a couple minotaurs or big cyclopses or maybe gorgons left, whichever, any, pick one of those three, I don't care. And since they have more health, you'll be disappointed to see that even after killing three or four of them in the exact same way, on top of however many you'd already defeated when the grunts were still around, there's still one spawn point dropping one more of them at a time, and no more than one at a time. It stretches many fights out by another couple minutes, and this happens constantly, especially in the fights where you can't just say screw it and keep moving because they walled off the room to turn it into an arena. It genuinely turns some fights, even early on, into these Sisyphean tasks, and all because one enemy spawn was further away than the others, or maybe because that type of enemy, for whatever reason, preferred orbiting around you at a distance instead of coming in and fighting you, so that particular baddie always got the least amount of damage relative to the others while you were wiping out the hordes. If these encounters instead registered a set number of grunts, minotaurs, whatever it might be, and a set maximum to ever be alive at once for memory purposes, then it wouldn't matter if you killed a minotaur A or B because they would just spawn another one until the quota ran out. A minor distinction, I know, when you hear some guy complaining about it in a stupid YouTube video, but it's a lot more noticeable of a distinction when you just want to move to the next room and there's still one spawn point with 15 more enemies left. At the very least, new enemy types are introduced at a relatively consistent pace, and in between that you'll often see reskins of the older enemy types with better armor to keep up with your damage upgrades. This is a good thing, of course, during the encounters that don't have a high enemy respawn quota hidden on the back end. Let me be clear, this game was never difficult on normal, at least for me. Really, the only frustrating parts of fights in this game were the occasional tendency to get stunlocked for a few extra hits if you get knocked down, and that's really the main thing that's magnified if you decide to play on hard or the post-game god mode difficulties, essentially forcing you to only use the most basic combos lest you be interrupted by an endless barrage of poke attacks. Between this and higher difficulties pumping up enemy health across the board, surprisingly, even the most die-hard of God of War 1 fans online aren't gatekeepy, even they say that you should absolutely avoid playing on higher difficulties since it's more a test of patience than any sort of higher level combat mastery. And so, even knowing ahead of time how hard it is to max out all your upgrades in God of War 1, before I was out of Athens, I already found myself just kind of saying screw it and running past some encounters after I'd had my fill of the near-endless one-by-one respawns. 
It's just tiring, especially given that from the moment that Kratos' boat docks at the Athens port up through saving the Oracle, there has been zero story progression. After such an honestly intriguing start, everything's put on halt and you're put through two or so straight hours of fight after fight after fight with a couple very basic puzzles sprinkled in. Again, in the moment, I was pretty cool with it because, hey, brain off smashing things is fun. I mean, I was getting new powers frequently and I kept getting great, relatively unique evolving aesthetics in Athens, or I just kept seeing things that made me wonder whether that particular designer was inspired by this game or that movie. There were some, you know, quirks here or there where if you went down to open a chest you saw on an alternate path, it might make you jump down and retread through a prior area to get back to where you were and start progressing again, but I figured that was just one of those weird one-offs that so many games have, rather than an omen. It's right after this cryptic cutscene with a gravedigger that the game starts to turn over, although to be clear, there are still a number of great individual moments ahead. The game starts to lean hard into puzzles, cutting the brisk pacing to a crawl at points from here on. First, we have two puzzles back to back that amount to mostly block pushing. You've got to block the holes in a wall here to stop enemies from getting through so that you can slowly tiptoe across the railings on the second floor without being attacked, and then in order to save the oracle, you've got to push one column down onto this elevator, push a second column on top of the first one, and then slowly kick the stack across the courtyard. In the pursuit of immersion or something, by the way, different blocks like these tend to have different weights, meaning that your charged kicks often only go a couple feet. This was a rare section where the camera angle actually misleads a bit as well, because this jump doesn't quite look uh, makeable at first. Or at least it didn't to me in part because Kratos didn't grab the ledge the first time I tried to make the jump, so maybe that was just one of those weird quirks that ended up misleading me and wasn't just the camera's fault. Either way, I was ever so briefly afraid that I had to push these two columns and leapfrog with an angled shifting camera across each of them without really having a drop shadow to see where I need to platform. It's the kind of thing you could totally see this kind of game doing around this time, but after a moment, mercifully, I realized no, that's not the case. After the Oracle peers into Kratos' mind and we get a bit more of his backstory, story as this fearsome Spartan captain who built up an army through his never-ending bloodlust, she opens the path to the Desert of Lost Souls, where the last titan Kronos has been roaming for eons, forced by his son Zeus to carry the whole last Temple of Pandora on his back while the never-ending sandstorm tore at his flesh forever. Honestly, probably the coolest liberty this game takes with the traditional Greek myths. It's totally in character. The sewers and desert are both actually pretty brisk and still visually and thematically distinct, so although I did say the turning point was right before this part, that's more because you start to see more questionable stuff pop up more and more frequently. For example, having to push a block uh, again, but this time against the grain of a conveyor belt going against you, this game might genuinely give Ocarina of Time a run for its money with its cumulative amount of block pushing playtime. The desert section begins in a wide open area, forcing Kratos to listen for the sounds of the three sirens that are roaming the wastes so that he can defeat them and open the path ahead. Now this isn't an oh wow this is brand new in 2005 thing, but their faint song playing in stereo or surround sound to guide you in the right direction, that sort of thing is never not going to make me all giddy, I just, I, I love it. And thankfully the developers were nice here, none of the chests in this area will contain any of the health or magic upgrade collectibles, it's all just bonus experience if you choose to wander around for a bit. From the siren audio tracking to the visual pomp of parting a sea of sand and running through it, it's, it's all just great. Now, what I don't love is that you have to fight like 20 more sirens immediately afterwards because they just, they just keep spawning. I, it feels like it might have been a weird compromise for the cutscene that comes next because there was a cut level that was supposed to be here. See, climbing Kronos to get into the temple was originally intended to be an entire level in its own right, but it would have taken so much time due to how resource-intensive the vision was going to be, running up a string of platforms while Kronos chases behind you and destroys everything. So instead, this ascent is that other A to B cutscene that I mentioned earlier. It's thrown together as a montage showing Kratos' three straight days of climbing. That one explanation alone, three days, even putting aside the animation itself of this cutscene, saying that better highlights the scale of just how big Kronos is and just how determined Kratos is to end his nightmares than any gameplay section ever could have, so this was the right decision in my opinion. Plus, it's exactly the kind of absurd description you would expect to hear in Greek myth. The power creep was real back then, too. Didn't you cause me a bunch of trouble somewhere? Hope you had fun beating your cock. Now it's my turn.
At the front gate to the temple, Kratos meets the first person who had ever attempted to break in, who, in another classic Greek-styled punishment, was then smited by the gods and forced to live forever, burning the bodies of every fool who would brave the temple after him. So I've said a few times already that God of War 1 isn't that kind of game when compared to its more challenging or precise hack-and-slash neighbors, that it doesn't try to compete on merit since it's also a half-adventure game. Well, it's also not that kind of game when put up next to adventure games. That's not just my takeaway for the record as we enter the Rings of Pandora Mega Dungeon, and it's not intended to be a critique, that's an admission from the minds behind the game. Since from a design standpoint, the goal wasn't to take a handful of mechanics and iterate on them over the course of the game like you traditionally do when making a game, but instead to keep introducing new things entirely. Every new section of the game in many ways ended up meaning that they were starting over, and that's not counting all the times they also started over midway through a section, scrapping a few levels, and countless attack and enemy animations. Now, personally, I don't always see that in the end result, since so many of the puzzles are iterations of pushing things around, but we are still talking about a game that in the span of a few minutes can go from a wide shot as you cross a massive bridge, to hanging on a rope and hitting enemies with some Mortal Kombat looking drop kicks, to navigating a vertical labyrinth while climbing on a wall full of enemies, to tightrope walking, to exploring countless small side paths that house a hidden chest, and, of course, to combat. The variety necessary to turn a journey into an odyssey is in many ways a prelude to the popcorn action games that would come a few years later, doubly so when nearly every single one of these scenarios needs unique combat and grab animations. And the compromise then is that you have to explicitly go for style over substance much of the time. And so, God of War was always intended to be a little bit shallow, and I don't say that as an insult. One spot where this crosses over between the two disparate styles of game that this game tries to meld is in the hitboxes on anything sharp and pointy. The big sharp and pointy giveth, and it taketh away. On one side, the hitboxes on Kratos' chain blades always jut out just a bit beyond where the physical model ends, and in a few instances, it almost feels like they operate on classic Doom's vertical scaling. Since you can't precisely aim the attacks up or down, they just hit flying enemies even if it feels like they're floating well above where you're swinging. On the flip side, this game loves using spinning blades as a platforming challenge or as part of a timed puzzle, and the blades, without fail, will hit you a few times even if you swear you should be well out of range. Near the start of the Rings of Pandora, there's a puzzle where you have to flip two levers in rapid succession to open a gate and make your way through the door at the end of the room, all while dodging this crisscross pattern of saw blades. If you get hit at all, odds are good that getting up's gonna take too long and you should just wait for the puzzle to start over. If you wait more than one, or maybe if you're lucky, two cycles of the blades going back and forth, the gate will close right in your face as you reach the exit, and sadly you can't Indiana Jones dodge roll right underneath it. In other words, no bueno, partly because the room's panning camera is also just a bit too close for how tight your timing and spacing needs to be. I don't know, I would just like to have the camera either show the whole room or just stay in place while I'm trying to hope that Kratos' momentum-killing second jump gives me just enough of a buffer over the blades that the game doesn't just decide that I got hit anyway. There's a bit more of this saw blade stuff later in the dungeon too, except this time you'd be platforming over a bottomless pit. Great. Later near the end of the game, there are two back-to-back -back vertical climbs on these spinning blade pillars, and if you're even slightly too close to the pockets of air surrounding the blades, you're falling all the way back down to the start of the climb, taking damage from each blade you hit on the way down. Thankfully, the game's checkpoints almost always throw you right near the start of the encounters in question or the start of the room you're in, but there's something cruel about making it 85% of the way through this game without ever really struggling in fights, only to get the PlayStation trophy for the game asking you if you want to be a little baby and turn the difficulty down to easy solely because you died one too many times on a block-pushing puzzle with an absurdly tight window before some spikes would then fly up and kill you. I'm... I'm still a little upset about that one. The game even tells you that puzzles and puzzle timing don't change with the difficulty, so even on easy, it's just as annoying as it is on hard, and it's just making fun of you for the game's own shortcomings by saying, hey, turn the difficulty down, bitch. Anyway, The Rings of Pandora, like I touched on a bit already, is where the majority of the game's story flashbacks take place, and just like some classic Greek tales, they tend to come out of left field just to give the story a chance to wax for a bit. The first of these comes a couple minutes after finishing the first section of the temple, in what's otherwise a random hallway full of bodies of previous soldiers who'd tried to find Pandora's box. The Harpies didn't get these guys yet, I guess. Now, Kratos could tell that these soldiers had been taken down by some of Ares' troops, and his mind flashes back to the moment that he'd become a servant to the God of War. At his weakest moment, about to be killed by a barbarian after his army had been routed, Kratos calls out to Ares. 
Destroy my enemies, and my life is yours. That desperate call for aid will come to haunt Kratos for all his days. By the gods, what have I become? I don't know that we've really earned that last bit of almost scared introspection yet, given that Kratos has barely had a word in the last several hours, especially since 20 minutes after this, he's without any second thought sacrificing a random dude to open a door. Also, that's a block puzzle too. You just kind of know that this was one of those moments where somebody said, No, but that'd be totally sick though, imagine the guy getting burned alive or whatever. And to be clear, it, it is it is pretty sick. This section made me laugh because it's so perfectly mid-2000s edge. But at the same time, just like how God of War isn't that kind of action game and it isn't that kind of puzzle game, it's also arguably not that kind of cinematic story where you're meant to look at it beyond the surface level and what seems cool, because if you do so, the creator would then say the point was to never be that deep, even though he had said at the time that the point was to be that deep. It's a bit of a have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too situation, where this mascot being a cool, badass anger outlet perhaps started to win out over loftier film auteur goals, once the massive stress of directing a multi-million dollar project started to crystallize. I mean, Jaffe once straight up said that therapy made him realize that characters like Kratos and Twisted Metal's Sweet Tooth were formed from his own inner anger, his own demons. These flashbacks may well have mirrored his own flashbacks to that canceled Dark Guns game, to the stress of that project and the fear of blowing a second blank check opportunity, perhaps the last one. And it's in these sorts of trying moments that Kratos, for just a moment, snaps out of his cold front, where we get to see a bit more depth, only to revert back to his front to cope, and we see him overcompensate violently to push forward. Is that compensating just our Kratos, or was that part of the inner Kratos at the time as well? It's part of what makes the character so fascinating to look at, because once he does start to change, evolve, and find peace as other directors and creators begin to use their own lives and experiences as inspiration, you can see how that personally affects the guy whose inner Kratos never seemed to break free from those chains, given how often he lashes out. For the record, I definitely didn't expect that would be the tragic character in this story either, but hey, the point here is to always look at that human side of the stories, and even if I think the dude comes off as a chode a lot of the time, this story doesn't exist without his story. Nevertheless, I adore the visual work in this scene, with these hand-painted portraits coming to life as key characters phase from 2D into moving 3D models. It's the kind of style that ages far more gracefully than many other options would have. Even the zoom shot face cams of Kratos speaking, they still look solid, but they're definitely a bit doofy in comparison. With all that in mind, I should really call this more of a segment of a scene rather than a scene itself, since it cuts and picks up and bursts throughout the rest of the temple. About two hours after this, we see the first pickup, where Ares grants Kratos his wish, which Y yeah, duh. And in making the warrior his servant, Ares brought down the Blades of Chaos and seared the chains into Kratos' flesh, his permanent branding for his chosen warrior. Also, Ares has got some Liam Neeson face going on here, right? Uh, that's not just me, is it? Another hour after this, we get another half-scene showing Kratos massacring a village against the warnings of the town's oracle, and after obtaining Pandora's box and slowly pushing it through a couple rooms back to the temple's doors, we finally get the full story. Although, not before Ares throws an absolutely disgusting shot put across a whole ass mountain range and nails Kratos in the chest from several miles away, killing him. It's in his totally real, definitely final moments that we see Kratos had unwittingly killed his wife and child in that attack, and the village oracle imbues their ashes into his skin as a permanent reminder of this horrid act. Kratos wakes up falling into the depths of Hades, pulling himself to safety by stabbing that same boat captain he let fall into the Hydra's mouth earlier. That's the second time there's some sad realization followed immediately by comic relief. Maybe not the best place for that if we're looking at this from that critical lens under which the game wanted to shine, but, but hey, it made me laugh, so dissonance be damned. Okay, so let's run it back a bit. I know there was a whole five hours of gameplay I just passed over to get to the important stuff. A lot of the Rings of Pandora I've already touched on, from the center room of the dungeon itself being a puzzle, to it having these long and winding forks, to the architect being similarly fooled by the gods into completing an endless quest, and to the architect's family skulls being keys, because why not? 
Despite my eyes glazing over due to how long we're trapped in this dungeon, there is still a decent bit of visual variety, with the Challenge of Poseidon taking you through some surprisingly competent swimming sections while the Challenge of Hades throws you into multiple kill labyrinths where the only way to progress is to find and defeat every last enemy, even the ones hidden behind a moving crush block that secretly pulls back a tiny bit further every three shoves and unveils a hidden room. Really, it's just that uneven pacing rearing its ugly head that gets me here, with the attempted intrigue of the Kratos backstory cutscenes, struggling to fill the gaps where you're mostly fighting longer and longer waves of enemies or navigating puzzles that aren't nearly as clever as they think they are. The boss fight against the Minotaur comes about two-thirds of the way through this dungeon, and it's one of the highlights that really stands out both in this area and the entire game. I mean, for one, you enter this room a good while before this fight, and you know immediately from the banging on the door that something sick is going to be coming later on. And then once you unlock that door and start the fight, you have to chip at its armor bit by bit, first with some combat to stun it, then with some wiggly analog stick QTEs to stun it further, and finally by shooting a pillar at it each time it's stunned. Wonderful foreshadowing for Kratos getting pillared about an hour and change after this. Plus, seeing this thing's health bar covered in armor just like the beast itself, and slowly breaking that armor into chips before finally getting to actually damage it with Kratos' regular attacks, that is perfect UI work here. Like a lot of this game, it's soured a little bit by some weird pacing, since after this high point, you grab another skull key from a tomb and then walk right back into this room with the dead Minotaur, where, for some reason, that Hades magic power-up is given to you, with a required tutorial fight for that power-up in the same room. Just kind of weird to reuse the site of this awesome boss fight for taking down some basic enemies. If you really want to dig into things here and start to poke holes in that whole idea of designing a temple and puzzles and hazards that feel logically designed in-universe that the game was trying to tout, you could probably ask why the Minotaur fight is here protecting one of the Architect's Kid's tombs rather than at the final area right before Pandora's box, because there's another lull after this fight in the form of the Cliffs of Madness area. Here we've got another couple hours of even less clever puzzles. I'm talking slowly push and rotate blocks to fill a square gate, playing Tetris essentially, or kick a block across an L-shaped room on exceptionally precise timing so that you can use it as a platform before the spikes come up and kill you. Then there's some weird sudden backtracking between parts of this incredibly samey looking cliffside to boot, where they needed to put a cutscene in to try and show you which part of the cliffside you have to go out of your way to go back to to get to the next area. Uh, it doesn't really work because there's a lot of areas that look like that. And this all comes before we get to a final, final, final Architect's Tomb section of the temple before we finally move on. And of course, these areas in Pandora's Temple have introduced at least one new type of enemy in each, and then they've beaten that type of enemy to death by throwing so many of them at you back to back to back in combat encounters that you're almost certainly starting to just run past half the time. To think that this part of the game was intended to have both that opening climbing chrono sequence and another time-sensitive puzzle sequence where you'd be running from a sandstorm while fighting enemies and platforming on a constantly moving elevator panel, I, man, I am glad this game didn't have any more time in the pipeline because another hour plus of this section really could have straight up just killed the game. Best of all, the Hades section we're about to dig into has the worst of all of this, as it was the part of the game that I mentioned earlier that was the most rushed due to impending deadlines and development crunch. Now first, let's talk about those power-ups for a moment since I did promise I would dig a bit more into the combat, and so that I can further paint the picture of why the dragging fights are such a disappointing drawback to a game that could have honestly been 2-3 to three hours shorter and significantly better because of it. There are six major power-ups in total, five of them provided to Kratos by the gods in those little tutorial rooms that I just mentioned. Poseidon's Rage is the first one you get way back on that Hydra ship. Right after that, near the start of Athens, you obtain Aphrodite's power-up, after you rip off Medusa's head that is, allowing you to use her head to turn enemies to stone and shatter them in a single hit. It's actually used a few times in puzzles too, which is really neat, quickly reminding you that you have to keep thinking outside the box as you, for example, freeze a minotaur on top of a pressure plate to open the path forward. Sadly, that's one of the few times they ever actually do something like this, and like a lot of puzzles in God of War 1, the timing's a bit too quick for my tastes, but hey, brownie points for trying. Because you obtain Zeus's lightning throw power up about an hour later, followed shortly thereafter by a second weapon, the Blade of Artemis, right as you enter Pandora's Temple, the game seems to be implying that it's going to give you upgrades at a consistent tick every 40 to 60 minutes, with only one more left four hours in. That's what had me thinking that this game was a lot shorter than the 8 to 9 hours that you would commonly see. You'd have no reason to expect the pace the game sets up would cease so suddenly with, again, a 5 hour dungeon. It's honestly almost impressive. The post-Minotaur power-up given to you by Hades summons the undead to fly around and help you fight enemies. It's a bit too little too late though, since your earlier abilities will have far outclassed it thanks to all the upgrades. 
Defeating enemies or opening certain chests, these of course grant you experience that you can use to level up your attacks or magic in whatever order you please. You even get to watch the gooey red liquid drain as you hold the X button to slowly apply experience to a weapon. It's not the most engaging thing when you've racked up 10,000 XP, but it lets you contemplate how much chaos you've wrought so far, so I kinda do like it. Upgrading Kratos' Blades of Chaos, the iconic chain blades, will unlock new sets of attacks and combos as you progress from level 1 to level 5, from simple stuff like a dive kick to an extra strong counter attack after parries to what's simply a better launcher attack than the awkward one you start with. A lot of them do end up looking similar to the fancy press square and your blades spin around and kill things, but they're useful additions even ignoring the fact that upgrading also gives you a damage buff, so like, duh, do it. I will say that rarely the order in which these attacks unlock feels maybe a bit disjointed, like I would have loved to have the dodge roll attack far sooner than level 4, but I'm honestly glad the game doesn't try to let you unlock individual attacks like we've seen other games do at times. Instead, it hides what upgrades are coming with that next level until you choose to level up, since again, it's just still not that kind of game where specific moves really matter all that much unless you're going really hardcore. Giving the player way too many unlock options would just make it more likely that they would accidentally choose to skip what might have otherwise become one of their bread and butter attacks, and because harder difficulties really just make it so that you have to use the more limited combos from the start of the game to be able to more easily parry cancel so that you can avoid taking any cheap hits that will inevitably lead to more cheap hits while you're being juggled on the ground, I would much rather be sad that I don't have the ability to attack out of my dodge slightly sooner than I would have liked then have this game run into even more potential balance issues. Once you've upgraded the Blades of Chaos once, you also unlock the Rage of the Gods, the one ability not provided directly by one of those god door tutorials. This is your run-of-the-mill temporary god mode power-up. I unlocked it after the sex minigame. I, that's, I don't know why that's in my notes, but it's here. Pro tip, don't ever go for a QTE or a grab attack while in rage mode because your timer doesn't pause for anything. For the Blade of Artemis and the magic attacks, upgrading them really just makes them stronger, slightly faster, and maybe adds a secondary attack here or there. Medusa's Gaze doesn't speed up quite enough when upgraded to be super useful in combat a lot of the time, since you have to stand still and point to use it, and it eats a lot of magic in the process. Likewise, Zeus's Fury is pretty much only useful for the occasional archer that's shooting at you from the background where you can't reach them, and upgrading it just makes the lightning bolts slightly faster and lets you charge them. The Artemis Blade is pretty slow and clunky, I feel like a lot of players don't care for it that much, but honestly, I found a lot of use in it against the bulkier enemies since it's got a really fun spin attack. And that brings us all the way back to Poseidon's Rage, the first one you get. Upgrading this bad boy increases the damage radius and lets you mash the circle button to do even more damage while extending the attack for a few more moments. Relative to the other magic attacks, this thing's damage to magic meter burn ratio is so high that there's rarely a reason to use anything else, especially since you're invincible while using it. It's such a damn good move that the go-to strategy for the speedrun trophy on PS3 is to do your second playthrough as Mommy Milker's Kratos since it gives you infinite magic and double XP, so you just spam Poseidon's Rage the entire game, upgrade it immediately, and get through the entire game in about four hours. But again, the thing is, even if Poseidon's Rage is going to be a lot of most players' bread and butter going through God of War, it doesn't just make the combat encounters a two-second cakewalk. Enemies get progressively stronger and spongier, and their spawns get progressively respawnier. That's, that's a word, trust me. And since no matter what, you're not going to be able to max out all your upgrades on a normal playthrough without an exploit, once you've got Poseidon's Rage and your chain blades upgraded, you can, and probably honestly should, just start running past many fights if they go on longer than a minute or two. Every fight is genuinely just padded after the first or second respawns. Nothing else changes, it doesn't get harder, it's just a waste of your time. If the later armored versions of any particular enemy type had an extra move, or if there were more enemies like the shield wielders that require a certain attack to break through and damage them, rather than just increasing enemy health all the time and pretending that giving you more enemies to fight but the same number on screen as you were already fighting anyway, any of these things would honestly have changed my takeaway of God of War 1's combat. Too, too rarely are there unique fights like the ones on a moving conveyor belt, and too, too often you can see exactly where the think tank felt, okay, it's been four minutes, place another arena room here, and paste the exact same enemy spawns from the last one. 
If nothing else, the sponginess part of enemies does serve a good purpose of building to one oh-so-satisfying payoff. See, the enemies in Hades are by far the strongest and spongiest reskins of them all, and also they just look cool in general because of the whole flaming lava vibe thing they have going on. And they come in unskippable encounters that sandwich around some absolutely dreadful platforming mazes across these constantly spinning pillars that are covered in blades, surrounded by pesky enemies trying to knock you off, and of course there's also a bottomless pit below. None of that part is fun for the record, I know I said there's a cool payoff, but this part sucks. I happen to get lucky that my time here wasn't nearly as frustrating as the general consensus seems to be. I kinda just said screw it from the start and kept jumping from platform to platform, ignoring enemies and hazards, not caring if I made a jump or failed, and happening to make it to the exact correct endpoint on the first or second try. See, me getting tired of all the constant samey fighting and running past stuff served as a good training for this part. Once you reach the end of the Hades level, you find a literal rope's been thrown to Kratos, as he climbs his way out of Hades thanks to the help of that weird gravedigger from earlier. Now, I don't believe the games ever directly ended up stating this, but this guy is Zeus in disguise, putting his thumb on the scale of one of his kids' silly little wars, as he always tends to do in Greek myth. But here's where the master stroke comes in, one of my favorite tropes in any dumb power fantasy game. When you run through the Oracle's temple once more, now destroyed by Ares' assault, all of the enemies you encounter are the weakest, earliest reskins of each, so you get the one-two punch of going from the longest fights to absolutely shredding through even the biggest enemies in a couple hits as Kratos is finally reaching the end of his journey. Now, there's a bit of whiplash in going from plodding through the majority of the game in one area to a little side jaunt in the underworld, and suddenly, boom, we're at the final boss, but I think we're well past the point of being surprised when this game's pacing is more stop and start than rush hour traffic. I I'm just kind of glad we're finally getting somewhere. Now, Pandora's box itself doesn't really live up to the hours of build and anticipation and the likely lifetime of build you would already have in your head from that being used as a constant idiom. When Kratos finds Ares, the dude's just kind of yelling out into the sky at Daddy Zeus. He sounds like a wimp. He acts the part too, because he looks away from Kratos, letting the latter knock Pandora's box right out of his hands and open it for himself. Kratos becomes big, because that's what we've been spending six hours working towards, Ares grows some spider legs because that's a thing, and after the first phase of this fight, the god of war, the, the other one, sucks Kratos into his own psyche somehow. Well, in my case, not before my Kratos milked him for some extra experience in the final QTE of the phase, because that's the only way you can max out your weapons. I, I had to get the trophy somehow. Ares forces Kratos to relive his single lowest moment, fighting off a near endless barrage of Shadow Kratoses to protect his wife and daughter. Honestly, one of the coolest moments in the entire game conceptually. Having a very limited health pool and having to frequently donate your own health to your family by hugging them tight, it's such a great way to have Kratos drop the facade for just a moment while still being in the middle of tearing dudes' faces off. You couldn't really have this same kind of impact in a cutscene, it being part of gameplay is stellar. Now, the fight itself, story of this game really, could have definitely done with a few hundred fewer respawns, because it forces you to rely on well-timed Poseidon's rage bursts and your god mode meter rather than really getting to unleash a ton of violent dad vengeance using the very blades that struck down the family you're protecting. The moment doesn't really get to breathe once you see just how many times these guys respawn, and it doesn't feel like this overwhelming, unachievable thing because you've already been dealing with something similar for most of the game anyway. Even when you do win, and mind you, you are supposed to win here, it's not like losing takes you to this cutscene I'm about to describe, Ares rips the chain blades from Kratos' skin and shoots them into his dream family. Now without the Blades of Chaos, both in this mind arena and in real life, Kratos looks up and realizes that the sword-shaped bridge we had crossed hours earlier in this same area could be used as a sword. I guess I don't know why the Blade of Artemis couldn't have been used for this section since you already have to have it no matter what, unless there's a way to skip it somehow that I don't know about, but the final fight of this game thus takes place with a weapon you've never used before, with a moveset you've never used before, against an enemy with multiple unblockable attacks in a fight where your health bars are a tug-of-war battle. It's equal parts neat on paper thanks to that tug-of-war thing, and lame in practice thanks to everything else, but at the very least it ends with one of the hardest lines in gaming history. That night. I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. I mean, come on, magnificent. Now, one of the funniest parts of this whole tragic journey is that Kratos had missed the catch in his little genie's wish way back at the start of the game. Athena never promised that his nightmares would cease if he defeated Ares. Her response when he asked was that his sins would be forgiven. Again, classic Greek mythical tale, always remember to cross your T's, folks, and if someone weasels out of a question, don't go and kill thousands without asking for an actual firm yes or no. 
This flashes us forward back to where we were at the start of the game, with Kratos throwing himself off the cliff, where the gods once again toy with him by keeping him alive and declaring him to be the new god of war. He's now too powerful and too important to just let die. Kratos takes his spot on the throne, and that is the end of God of War, and the beginning of God of War 2. Now, there is some cleanup in the form of 10 post-game arena challenges that you have to complete all in one sitting to unlock some bonus content. These are honestly actually just ridiculous at times, some of the worst combinations in the game yet of exceptionally tight time limits, frustrating never-ending respawns, and even some minor platforming and momentum hiccups where in the regular game they'd be fine, but they become head-splitting when it means that you're shoved off a platform and instantly fail a challenge. Since most of this bonus content was retconned pretty quickly, it's not really worth doing unless you're a trophy hunter who wants to waste at least a good hour or two at minimum, and that would be on top of a second speedrun playthrough in under five hours on a fresh file because God of War 1 has no new game plus. I will say, playing with the bonus costumes like Agent 47 or Chef Kratos is at least worth the few minutes of giggles, though. The bonus content itself is a bit of fascinating insight into the very different paths that God of War could have taken, but that's really all it is. Ideas being thrown at a wall, either weaker early drafts of things that would come in the PSP games, or a weird Indiana Jones God of War sort of thing set in the modern-day ruins of Pandora's Temple slash Kronos' skeleton. Ignoring these bonuses and ignoring the kinda weak final fight, it's hard to deny that God of War 1 ends on a stellar but bittersweet high note. You can buy a lot of goodwill with a sick ending, and between that and the fact that when I think of the game after some time away, my first thoughts are the really strong Athens sections, the brisk pace, the rare moments inside Pandora's Temple where the puzzles can get genuinely really cool, and the strong wrap-up, and between all of that, it's easy to gloss over a lot of this game's many shortcomings. Some slightly tighter enemy placements, and perhaps a better dedication to sprinkling story beats a bit more evenly throughout, is really all I'd actually have asked for. Oh, and maybe to just skip the tightrope walking entirely. That would've made everybody happy, I promise. And those issues aren't just my modern lens side of breaking this game down either. These are similar critiques I'd even had back in the day, both when I would try the game out a couple times at my family's house, or with some of God of War's contemporaries. I may not have bought the game or borrowed it from my brother since it just never clicked with me back then, but that didn't mean that I wasn't playing the hell out of Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks later that year, or dabbling in DMC and Onimusha. Some of these issues were just the basic design tenets of these games at the time. God of War 1 is maybe just the most egregious about it at points of the big AAA samples. Jumping to that modern lens, I think that's where I actually appreciate God of War more. Over the course of so many different historical breakdowns here on the Golden Bolt, I've been piecing together individual puzzles of the early history of PlayStation franchises, studios, figureheads, or even just the brand itself. And it's with this one that a lot of those smaller puzzles started to fit together as this larger mosaic. If you asked me right now what the nexus point was that started Sony down the path of consolidating its ragtag, decentralized mess of an organization into a more unified vision, for better and worse, mind you, the first God of War would be my answer. That's not to say it was single-handedly responsible for everything that came after, that would be crock, but think about it. This game properly launched Santa Monica, the studio intended by Sony to be the test for a more centralized publishing arm after years of just flinging shit against the wall on the PS1. It was PlayStation's first story-driven cinematic game design focus that also was able to find mass-market success, selling several times as well as the earlier artsier attempts like the Icos of the world. And where Ico needed to walk for God of War to, uh, kill, God of War did the same by helping build a standard next to similar AAA hits like the GTAs and Halo 2s of the world, a goal to lead into the set pieces and moments that would define the coming console generation. In the case of God of War, it wasn't always the best example between QTEs and helping continue the existing idea that mature had to equal super violent and angry, but nevertheless, it helped set the tone for what was to come. In doing so, it also set the table for a new generation of creatives to start carrying the torches within that PlayStation development ecosystem, an ecosystem that after a decade of quietly masking the behind-the-scenes chaos was only just beginning to properly congeal into something resembling a company. The old guard who had been around from the Wild West early days had been moving up into managerial roles, or they moved on to different pastures, whether that was at a studio level or at large, and both were usually hit by the same rude awakening that the up-all-night coding-in-your-garage mentality from the 90s wasn't gonna cut it in studios that had rapidly scaled up from 10 to 40, 100, or 200-plus people by 2005. 
that rapid crunchy turnaround wasn't gonna fit the bill for games that were now costing millions. Something was gonna have to change. And the new blood that was coming into this big ol' meat grinder that is the games industry was no longer mostly from white-collar engineering backgrounds anymore, because creating games was now a more targetable career ambition. That meant new ideas and new inspirations from that new generation. It meant that the folks being thrown into the now empty director's chairs, replacing that old guard, would be the ones expected to evolve the industry both in front of and behind the screen, while dealing with ever-growing lists of expectations and a huge question mark as to what the hell the director was even in charge of when it came to a game now. As players started to expect bigger, better, and more, a director couldn't just be the ideas guy, the vibes guy, or the project manager. And in PlayStation's case, as this new, consolidating hierarchy began to push for consistency, for bigger franchises rather than one-off risks, it's the cash cow god of war that bore the brunt of that while other studios and series were given more lenient leashes. That's gonna be the story and the behind-the-scenes battles that would define God of War 2. 3, Ascension, and the Reckoning that led to Dad of Boy. And those, my friends, are stories for another day, so you should definitely subscribe to keep up with this odyssey as I carve my way through it. If you haven't heard enough of my voice by now, definitely check out either my Twisted Metal series breakdown or my documentary on PlayStation All-Stars. Both cover huge swaths of both Santa Monica Studios' history and the PlayStation's PS3 era reckoning as a whole, things that would lead to the modern Norse saga of God of War. Or if you want a deeper cut, I have a video breaking down some of Sony's earliest published games ever and how they helped lead to the PlayStation's creation. Those were Nintendo games that happened to be developed by Pokemon's Game Freak. It's all part of a larger story that I've accidentally been weaving for years apparently, so you can't go wrong starting with any of them. Thanks so much for joining me on this first part of the journey. Please do share your thoughts in the comments if you have them, share the video with your friends, support on Patreon along with all of these wonderful folks to get access to the Discord, and a bunch of other perks like early or ad-free access to videos, do all the other YouTube things if you want, and until next time, stay golden.